Well, we are in our series called um, Seven Churches. Actually, can I just get somebody just to, just to do up the chandeliers a little bit, just the lights a little bit, just because uh, I just want to be able to see you this morning. Um, uh, we're doing our series called uh, Seven Churches uh, to, in Revelation. And so take out your Bibles and, and open up there. And uh, this morning we are up to the fourth letter, which is to the church at Thyatira. And just as we, um, as we uh, go to that place this morning, I just want to uh, bring it before the Lord. Father, I pray with all sincerity that we as a church today would have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to our church. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start uh, by talking to you this morning about the day that Jesus got mad. The day that Jesus got mad, and it's found in John's Gospel, chapter 2. Let me read it to you. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the tem- temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords, Jesus makes a whip, <laughs> he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, you imagine that, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned the tables And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And so you imagine the disciples are watching this going on. They're like, wow, Jesus just got really mad. And then they remembered. Then they remembered something. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus has this white hot passion for his house, for the glory of God. You could translate it as a jealousy. He has a jealousy for his father's glory. This statement uh, kind of was an identity marker of Jesus, the Messiah, who was going to come. He was going to restore order to the world. He was going to bring salvation He was going to restore order to his house, which with his coming is the church. There's a purifying effect that Jesus has on the church. And I think we've been seeing that. As you go through the churches, the letters to the churches at Revelation, you see that Jesus has this consuming zeal for his house, for his church. And it does actually have this purifying effect on us. On us, It calls out what's real. It causes us to kind of stare at the face what is real, what Jesus really loves. And it has this purifying effect, and it awakens us to God. And we saw in the first week that to Ephesus, it caused them to awaken their first love. They were good in their deeds and doctrine, but they'd left their first love. Awaken to loving God. And then we saw to Pergamum, Uh, that they were called to wake up to their compromise and to shut the door on compromise. And this morning we're going to look at the church in Thyatira, and specifically we're going to see Thyatira's trap. And so let's go through this text in this letter to Thyatira. It says in verse uh, 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, this is Uh, modern-day ruins of the ancient city of Thyatira in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, as we've been seeing. And Pliny the Elder in ancient times said that Thyatira was an insignificant city. Ephesus was like the New York, York. Pergamon was like the Las Vegas. Thyatira was an insignificant city. It was, you know, no big deal at all. And specifically, it was famous for its textile industry, specifically purple goods. And it's interesting, you see Paul, the Apostle Paul's first convert, was a woman called Lydia. And in uh, that uh, account of her conversion, you see that she was a seller of purple goods. Lydia was actually from this insignificant town 
of Thyatira. So they were known for their uh, kind of their um, trade guilds, their trade unions. A guild is like a, it's a workers' union. And so because they had a lot of textile industry, there was a lot of unions, a lot of kind of, uh, yeah, workers' unions in this city, more than any other city. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so this is the church in the city of Thyatira. And it says here, uh, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Don't forget who's writing this letter. Don't forget who's writing this letter and the description of the one who is writing this letter. In fact, just flick back one uh, uh, page and I want you to show, uh, show you who this author is. In verse 12 of chapter 1, this is John writing. He's in the cave in the island of Patmos receiving this vision. And he says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on t- turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. That's the representation for the church. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, which signifies his wisdom and his purity. His eyes were like a flame of fire. This uh, kind of tells us that he sees everything. His feet were like burnished bronze, which is a metaphor for uh, that he judges everything rightly, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters, his power. The power of his word. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. We saw that last week, the word of his judgment. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is the author of this letter. This is what he was like. And I want you to see this in the, the reaction of John. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. I fell at his feet as though John did what every other person who has seen Jesus in his glorified state does. They fall over at his feet. You know, if, if Jesus came to visit you at your house in his glorified state, it wouldn't be like, oh, come in, come in for a drink. It would be, whew, whew. it would be falling at his feet because of who he is because of just how powerful he is. He is the glorious Son of God. The glorious Son of God, that is who is writing this letter. And this title, the Son of God, is significant. In fact, it's the only place in Revelation where you have this specific reference to his identity as God, the Son of God. And it's significant because the church or the city of Thyatira, they worship the god Apollos, who was the sun god. And Apollos was actually known also as a son of Zeus. So Apollos was considered the son of God. And Jesus is saying here, no, 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 no. I am the son of God. I have words to say to you. I have things to say to you. Apollos is the god of this city, is not the son of God. I am the son of God. Hear my voice. And he affirms his kind of authority over Apollos by saying that he is the one who has eyes of like a flame of fire. He's the one who sees everything perfectly, and he sees it all. And he's the one who has feet like burnished bronze. He is the one who stands in judgment, in perfect judgment. And so this is who is writing this letter, these are who the words are. So come back over to Thyatira. The first, as we've seen with the other letters in verse 19, is there's a commendation for things that they've done well, but it's very short. It's just one verse long. It says, I know your works, and there's five things that Jesus knows. Your love, that's a very great thing to be known for. Your love is a very great thing to be known for. And your faith, your faith is a very great thing to be known for knowing that God can do what only God can do, believing in the God uh, who can do anything. And service, that's a very good thing to be known for. Your service, your serving. That person is always serving. They're always serving. That's a great thing to be known for. And patient endurance. I love seeing in people patient endurance, don't you? 
You see people who've just going through stuff and they're just taking hits after hits after hit. And they patiently endure. Man, that's inspiring. They're known for patient endurance and also that their latter works, which means their, you know, their latest works, exceed their first ones. That means that they're actually growing in these things. The, 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 these works are becoming more and more and more in their life. This is a church that is growing in their good works. Now, this is a church that is feeding the homeless. This is, this is a church that's welcoming the stranger. They're loving their neighbor. They're raising money for underprivileged kids, and these works in them are growing, and Jesus loves these works. But as I said, the commendation is quite short, and as with other letters, in verse 20, Jesus now comes with a correction. Remember, he comes with correction because he loves the church. He died for this church. He laid his life down for this church. He loves them, and he, he wants to come and lovingly rebuke this church for something. This is what Jesus does with the church. And it says in verse 20, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols." Now, who is this woman Jezebel? Jezebel is probably not her name. It's probably a title that is given to this person in Thyatira to actually explain what she's like, to explain what her spirit is like and the impact that she's having. And this is a title that is picked up from an account in the Old Testament, an actual woman uh, called Jezebel who was the wife of King Ahab. King Ahab was a king, one of the kings of God's people, Israel. And Jezebel is kind of brought in. uh, She marries uh, King Ahab. She's a foreign woman from another nation. She comes in. She marries King Ahab. But with her, she brings her gods, and she brings this kind of divisiveness about her. Okay, so uh, this is kind of what's being referred to. And and in that account in, in 1 Kings, what you actually see is as soon as uh, King Ahab marries Jezebel, uh, King Ahab actually sets up a shrine to Baal. And so uh, very quickly, she has an influence where uh, all of a sudden you can worship Yahweh and you can worship Baal. And so you have these two gods uh, kind of within the camp. And so uh, she is everything that the Israelites are trying to resist. She is divisive. She's everything that represents what they're trying to resist. You've heard that phrase, uh, the Jezebel spirit. Have you ever heard of that, the Jezebel spirit? Uh, This is referring to someone who is divisive. There was even a World War II bomb called Jezebel because what tends to happen when this bomb hits the ground is it blows stuff up, the the Jezebel bomb. Think about it. She was the opposite of, of, say, someone in the Bible like Ruth. You You know, Ruth, she was also a foreign woman. She was a Moabite woman. But what was the difference? Ruth actually came in, and she surrendered her identity. She surrendered it. She said, I'll take on uh, this covenant with Yahweh, the true God. I'll come under him. Whereas Jezebel comes in and says, no, I'm not surrendering nothing. I'm going to seduce you into my way. I'm going to seduce you into the worship of God. And so she is the representation of ungodliness, the representation of divisiveness, This is what this woman is like in this church in Thyatira. She has a Jezebel spirit. Now, why? Well, firstly, we see that she's claiming to be someone that she's not. Notice that Jesus said she calls herself a prophetess. She ain't. She calls herself something that she's not. Hey, be wary of that. Be wary of someone who calls themselves something that they're not. Uh, The second thing is that she calls things that are false to be true. Hey, be wary of that. You know, there's one thing to do something wrong and to know that you've done something wrong. It's quite another thing to actually do something wrong and call it right. That's that's an abomination to God, to call something that is false right. And so that's the second thing. She calls things that are false to be true. And then thirdly, she's causing this weakening sexual ethic, and she is also practicing that sexual immorality. So you think to yourself, okay, so what? There's one person 
in a crowd of a church that's doing really great things, love, service, faith, their latter works are exceeding their first. I mean, they're doing great things. There's one person doing something wrong. What's the alarm for? Why is this so bad? Well, you know, this is big for us because we do live in a mind your business kind of world, even in the church. We keep separate and we don't let people know what's going on, all that sort of stuff. And so, so what? You know, this is just the community of, the, of people that are doing good things. Why worry about one person? Why is Jesus so mad? Well, the reason is, is that the church in Thyatira are caught in the tolerance trap. Did you notice that? It said, but I have this against you, you tolerate. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. What a hot button word for our time. Tolerance, isn't it? You know, the traditional definition of the word tolerance is that you actually acknowledge uh, other people's views, and Christians have always been about that, because we're we're into religious freedoms. We are happy for other religions to uh, kind of worship their God and all of that, and, uh, and we want other people to tolerate our beliefs. And the reason is, is because as Christians, we don't impose the gospel on people. We propose it. We propose it, and we chuck it in the mix, and we trust that God uh, will do the work. We trust that truth will rise to the top. So we don't impose our faith. And if you are doing that, we shouldn't do it. We should propose the truth and allow God and the Spirit to do His work to bring people to Him. And so we're all about tolerating in the sense of acknowledging other people's views and people acknowledging our views too. Tolerance has kind of changed in the definition to kind of mean an opposition to anything that's absolute. There's no absolute truth. And so to tolerate is not just acknowledging that there's views that are different, but actually asking us or asking them to actually accept your views. And if you don't accept those views in the way that culture is creating them and pressuring them, then you're called something like a bigot or whatever. That's kind of like the the way it works. And so we have this church here in Thyatira, this tolerance kind of thing is seeping into their church, and there's a particular uh, person that's coming, and they're coming on the weekend, a Sunday service, maybe they rock up to a small group, you know, they're just around the place, loitering around the place, and it's sort of like this, we're going to have a bit more of an enlightened, enlightened approach to faith. You know, we've got new books, we've got new scholars, we've got people who've done some more research, those primitive beliefs, those strict beliefs that you had. I mean, are you serious in this day and age? Oh, come on. It's not that big a deal. You know, we're, we're going to be open now to different views and different lifestyles, and we're going to accept those things. And the church here is going along with that. Uh, they are caught in the tolerance trap. What is the tolerance trap? The dangerous focus on accommodating everyone out of a fear of offending someone but Jesus warns that it won't benefit anyone. It's a dangerous focus on accommodating everyone out of a fear of offending someone, and Jesus warns this won't benefit anyone. I don't want you to tolerate. I don't want you to tolerate things that are the opposite of me. So why did they get there? Why does a church get there? Why do Christians get there? Uh, why, Why does this happen? Well, firstly, it's a miscalculated the cost of following Jesus. They miscalculated the cost. Uh, I said to you that this was a city that was known for its guilds, for its trade unions. And, And these guilds were like families. So you would basically inherit the business of your father. You would take that business on and you would join that industry guild. And that was better for you to actually work in tandem together with other businesses uh, that were like-minded to yours. You know, they didn't have government social services, they didn't have Centrelink, they didn't have retirement, they didn't have government benefits, all that sort of stuff. So instead, what you did is you paid your dues into the guild and they would take care of you. So you might have your wedding at the guild. You might have your funeral at the guild. They would take care of you in your old age at the guild. Everyone's connected at the guild. Brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, those kids of your friends and family that you grow up with. Everyone's connected. And At these guilds, they would get together for these kind of feasts, for these parties, as unions and family groups do. And they would come together and they would, you know, have a God to worship. And then after that, they would uh, take the meat that they've sacrificed to these gods and they would eat uh, the meat together. And then afterwards, things would get a little bit wild. And they'd start to have a little bit of, you know, 
sexual activity going on here over in that corner and, and over in that corner. It was all kind of accepted. These are kind of these immoral feasts that were going on. But all of a sudden, you become a Christian. But you're in the guilt. Now there's a problem because it comes time, that annual time of the year, to pay your dues. All right, you've got to pay your money, but all of a sudden there's a problem now because, number one, you don't like where the money's going. You're a Christian now and, and, and you, things have changed. Your desires have changed. You don't like where the money's going. Or, or, you know, then after that, you, know, you show up at the feast and there's meat, but you know it's been sacrificed to idols, but you know, that's a worship act. And, and your heart is now preserved and, and set apart to worship Jesus alone. And so all of a sudden you've got this conflict going on. And then after the party, you're kind of encouraged to kind of indulge in the sexual activity. But all of a sudden, because you're a Christian, you've actually set your, side, your body aside for pure things. You've set your body aside for Jesus. You've set your body aside for one woman, for one man. Things are different now. I'm a Christian. What do I do? Because if I say that I'm a Christian and I start refusing these things, I lose everything, remember? I lose you know, my family, I lose my security, I lose my retirement, I'm destitute now, I'm poor. And who will look after me when I'm old? See the problem? Well, this woman comes along and she says, don't worry, you can have both. You can have both. You can worship Jesus and you can participate in the guild. Great! You can have both. I mean, see what sort of great news that is? I mean, you don't have to actually confront anything anymore. You don't have to really stand anything on anything. You don't have to pay any sort of cost anymore because you've got this person who seems coming with authority because she calls herself a prophetess. So she's coming with authority, and all of a sudden she's saying that you can have both. But let me tell you what's really happened here. Yeah, it's a real problem. Somewhere along the way, they miscalculated the cost of following Jesus. You know, all Jesus wants of you is everything. He wants every part, every part of you. Not most things except for a few things. He wants everything. Jesus said, whoever would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus said to the rich man, Sell everything that you have and come and follow me. It's a radical thing to follow Jesus. All Jesus wants of you is everything. He wants every part of you. They miscalculated the cost. You see how jealous Jesus is for his people? You see how jealous Jesus is for your affection, for your allegiance, for your love, for your single-mindedness, for your focus? Jesus wants every part of it. These people do not demonstrate zeal for God's house. They don't demonstrate a zeal for God's glory. They're caught in the tolerance trap. You know, this tolerance trap, it, it plays on our deepest faults as followers of Jesus. You know, what, you know what our deepest fault is? This is one of my, I want everything to be status quo. I want to keep everything nice. I don't want to feel the pinch of the Holy Spirit in my life. <laughs> Pinching on my flesh. I don't want to fight with the flesh. I want to keep it nice. I want to keep it safe. I want to keep it easy. I don't want to make waves. I want to keep it inclusive and accommodating because it's too hard. But Jesus is saying here, add up the cost, make your choice. Add up the cost of following Jesus, make your choice. When you're tempted at university to roll over on beliefs because you've got someone that you really like, you know, a friend that you really like and they seem really nice, but they've got this different view and they want you to believe that different view, add up the cost, make your choice. You know, when you're kind of coasting in the church and you want to have one foot in the church and you want to have one foot in the world and those the competing desires are in there, add up the cost of following Jesus, make your choice. That's what Jesus wants you to do. You know, when you're compromising in the workplace, you know what those areas are of compromise, whatever it is. Jesus wants you in those moments to add up the cost of following Jesus and to make your choice and to choose him. See, Jesus wants every part of our allegiance, even though it's going to hurt sometimes. It's going to cost sometimes. That's the first reason they're in this tolerance, tra tolerance trap is because they miscalculated the cost. Is it going to be Jezebel or is it going to be Jesus? 
And Jesus is really, I mean, here, he is setting up that. It's no one else. He is setting up that kind of choice. Is it Jezebel? Are you going to follow this way? Or are you going to follow me? This is uh, what Jesus wants. You can't have both. Well, the second reason that they're in this is because they underestimated church unity. This is really interesting because we don't talk about this a lot. But they underestimated the importance of church unity. I'm not going to say something that's just a little bit perhaps controversial for some of you. I don't know. But, you know, not everyone is welcome in a church. Not, not everyone is welcome in a church. Man, I mean, that's a pretty controversial thing to say these days. I think even on our Facebook banner, our public Facebook, we, say, we have, you are always welcome here. And that is true, actually. You are always welcome here. But it's interesting that there is some point where people are not welcome in a church. Let's start with the positive, though. Let's start with who is welcome. Firstly, people who wouldn't call themselves a Christian yet, but are seeking what it means, 100% welcome. Never doubt it. You might be, you might know you're different. You might know that you have not kind of, you know, landed there yet, but you are seeking, you're interested by who Jesus is, you're interested by who these crazy people in this room are. I mean, yeah, you are 100% welcome. I'm always saying that. I'm saying invite your friends. Come and hear. Come and hear the truth. I, you know, totally 100% welcome here. That's the first group. The second group who are welcome, of course, are people who are professing Christians, who are seeking to follow Christ, and by no means are they perfect. They are still battling, sometimes really battling with indwelling sin. I mean, they're really battling, and sometimes they feel like that, that more, there's more failure than success in their life. But they are professing Christians, and they have this desire to want God to work in their life and to do something in their life. There's this prevailing desire that they have. Never doubt that. 100% welcome. You're always welcome here. But this is who is not welcome here, and this doesn't come from me. You know, in my own flesh and naturalism, I would just invite everyone. But this is from Jesus here. It, it, It is a person who professes to be a Christian, but after being called on to repent of sin and given a period of time to repent of sin, refuses to repent of sin and openly practices a life that looks nothing like the one filled by the Holy Spirit, they are not welcome in the church. And that's what Jesus says. Notice that he says here, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Have nothing to do with her. You're tolerating her. And, and so I'm not talking about a person who is struggling and feels like there's more failure than success in their life, but really wants to follow Christ. I'm not talking about that person at all. Hear me loud and clear. I mean, I am one of those people at times that feels like my failure is just on top of me, and I don't feel worthy sometimes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person who is strident in their rebellion. They're strident in it. They believe in it. That person, it seems, is not welcome in the church. And Jesus says, and yet you tolerate her. I want you to see this. This is really radical to understand. But Jesus cares more about church unity than he does about an unrepentant person who might be offended. Do you you realize that? I mean, do you realize how much Jesus loves church unity? A body, his body, because it's his body. It's his body moving as one together doing what he wants them to do, enjoying him and serving others. Glory to God, joy to the city. This is how much he does it. And this is the kind of principle you see elsewhere in the Bible that a little leaven spoils the whole lump. And I've seen this kind of happen. You have, you know, one or a few people who kind of sow discord or divisiveness and it affects, it starts to spread out and it affects the whole lump. Now, this is why in Matthew 18, Uh, Jesus actually gives us this process for what you might call church discipline. Uh, There's this word, it's really, it's getting really old-fashioned in the church these days. No one talks about church discipline. It's just, you know, kind of old school. But it's in there, and and this is what it's about. It's not about public naming and shaming. In fact, when you actually look at it in Matthew 18, it's not about that at all. It actually seeks to resolve things in the church, differences, disputes, errors, all of that, with privacy. Privacy. Because in Matthew 18, it says, like, if if a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. And if he responds and seeks your forgiveness, done. It's over. 
No one has to know about that. It's actually kept between that person, so that sin doesn't spread out anywhere. But, it, but then it says is that if you go to your brother, you tell them their sin, and they refuse, so they're unrepentant about their sin, what does it say? It says, take two. Take someone with you, uh, go along and actually confront them. If they respond, it's dealt with. It's, it doesn't go any further. It's private. It's dealt with. That sin is over. Receive the forgiveness of God. Hallelujah. Grace. This is what it is. It's done. But it's, if they don't repent, it says something really hard. It says, tell it to the church. I, I really never want to have to do that. And if they respond at that moment, it's over. Again, privacy is over. But if they respond, grace is given and forgiveness is received and that person can be restored. But if they still refuse to listen, it says, let them be like a tax collector, which in that day was the, a person that you had nothing to do with. That's how strong the Bible is. That's how strong Jesus is on church unity. He has a zeal for his house. He has a zeal for God's glory. And that's why a spirit-filled church is one where people are serious about killing the sinful nature, being humble, being willing to see your fault, be willing to see your error and to let the Holy Spirit have more control for the building up of the whole body. Here's a principle for our church. It's okay to not be okay. I want you to know that. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. And that's a principle that you take from the Bible. You see, you know what? God doesn't want to eliminate us. He wants to elevate us. He wants us to go higher. He wants us to go deeper. How many of you have ever know that you've had to go through hard things in order to get greater things? How many of you know that? You've had to go through hard things to get greater things. This is what sometimes has to happen in us. We have to go through hard things. We have to feel the pinch of our flesh, feel the pinch of the Holy Spirit in order to go deeper, in order to soar higher. You know, uh, yesterday I went cockling at Goolwa Beach with my family. And, you know, these little shells that you have that you, you sort of, you know, uh, dig up. If you just have your hands on the surface of the sand, you can't feel them and you don't get the treasure. But if you actually dig your hands in a bit deeper, down a few inches down into the sand, you actually pull up the treasure, you pull up the cockle. This is the same thing in our Christian life. A lot of us just want to stay on the surface. We just want to stay on the surface. We don't want to go deeper. We don't want to feel the pinch of the Holy Spirit actually taking us to a new level. But if you do, if you reach down deeper, if you let God come into you deeper, you will pull up the treasure. You will pull up the greater thing. This is what God wants to do. So church discipline is not about naming and shaming. It's not about having control over people's lives. It's a grace of God that he actually wants to restore you back, to take you deeper, to elevate you higher, to make you go further, to make you go deeper with him. And so we must have a zeal for repenting from sin for the sake of God's glory and for the sake of church unity. The third thing that they did in the tolerance trap was that they minimized the seriousness of sin. They minimized the consequences of sin. Now, whenever people are living in both worlds, the first thing to play down is the consequences of sin. That's why progressive churches, or another name for it is perhaps liberal churches, where you kind of lower the authority of the Bible and all that sort of stuff. The first thing that they do in the name of accommodating everyone is they lower the doctrine of hell. So basically what happens is, if you're progressive or liberal, is that you have to get to a point where you become a universalist, which basically means everyone, all roads lead to God. You have to get there. Because what is driving you is not the Word of God, it's actually kind of your compassion for people. You have a horizontal focus before you have a vertical focus. And so what happens is you actually start to go, well, in order to accommodate everyone, all these people that I'm experiencing, I have to lower my doctrine on final judgment. I have to, because otherwise not everyone can get in. And so this is kind of what happens. You lower your doctrine on the consequences of sin. You minimize them. But look what Jesus does here is that he restates the consequences of sin in really confronting terms. Okay, look at this. Verse 22 
he says, Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. Again, you see Jesus' patience, his willingness to forgive, but you see him restate the consequences of sin. And they're in really serious terms. Notice that they're in direct proportion to her sin. You've been fooling around on a bed, I'll throw you on a sick bed. You see that? You see, the consequences of our sin are directly proportional. They are what we deserve if we continue in unrepentant sin. They will suffer great tribulation, it said. And this church needed this. They needed to hear, hear the real consequences of their sin. And we also need this. You know, in order to really appreciate grace, what do you need to see? I mean, in order to really appreciate God's love, his grace, what do we need to see? We need to see the blackness of sin. If you don't see the blackness of sin, if you don't think that sin is that serious, grace won't seem that good. But if you see how serious sin is, you will see how magnificent grace is. So if you want to kind of wake up as a Christian, if you want to be woken up out of your apathy, out of your compromise, out of opening the door to compromise, out of living one foot in the world and one foot in the church, if you want to, you've got to see the blackness of that. And you've got to see how amazing it is that God gives time that we see in the text for you to repent and to receive his grace and to be restored up, to be elevated higher, to be taken deeper. It, the traders in the temple, they had to see how corrupt their ways were. They had to see it, and it was really hard because Jesus had to come in and upend all of their trade, upend their livelihood. Jesus had to come in and display his anger on it. We get into this tolerance trap when we minimize the serious consequences of sin. It doesn't benefit anyone. You know, we think it does, but it doesn't benefit anyone. It, benefit anyone. it doesn't glorify God. It doesn't help us in our walk with God, and it doesn't actually help the person that is living in sin. You know why? Because they'll never get to the place where they come and kneel at the foot of the cross and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for saving me. I was lost, but now I'm found. There's a barrier up there, and you're the barrier because you're tolerating. That's what Jesus' is fault with this church is. And so, lastly, how do you get out of the tolerance trap? How do you get out? Well, I want to propose that this is the prayer that each one of us need to pray. Lord, give me zeal for your house. Give me a zeal for your glory. Give me zeal for your house. I want to suggest that this is what is also needed, that each one of us need to ask for a visit from the Holy Spirit. You see, you can't just manufacture this in your own life. You can't just say, okay, then I'll do better. You actually need to say to the Lord, I need your Holy Spirit to come in and change my heart from the inside out. Do this as a work of your Spirit in my life. And this is what the Holy Spirit wants to wake us up to. Firstly, it's this, that you can't fool God. I want you to see this in verse 18. Remember at the very, very first verse that Jesus has eyes like a flame of fire. You can't fool God. God can see everything. He sees it all, and he says this in his judgment of verse 22. Behold, I will throw her in a sickbed, and those who commit adultery, I will throw great tribulation. Verse 23, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches what? Mind and heart, the things that no one else can see. And I will give to each of you according to your works. You know, the Holy Spirit wants to wake up your heart today to see you can't fool God. He searches heart and he searches mind. The second thing that the Holy Spirit wants to wake us up to is to see that we have a better way. Look in verse 24. Uh, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on any other burden. How compassionate is Jesus. I don't want to lay on, I don't want to crush you. I don't want to crush you. And then he says this, only hold fast to what you have 
until I come. What do you have? You have a better way. You have something better than tolerance. You have something better than just accommodating everyone. You know what you have? You have the gospel. You have the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means he will forgive you of your waywardness. He will also give you both grace and truth to minister to others. You don't have to just be permissive of everybody, and you don't have to just be harsh to everyone with the truth. You have the gospel, grace and truth together to minister to others. And then thirdly, we see that you have a higher reward. See this at the end. The one who conquers, verse 26, and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. This is the shared inheritance that you have with Jesus. This is the higher reward. See the higher reward that you have in being faithful to Jesus alone, in giving him your everything, in serving him in everything, in not letting any part of your life be off limits to him. He will award you the morning star. You will share with him for eternity. You'll share his reign and rule. I wonder if you might pray that just as we bow our heads right now this morning. Lord, Lord, give me zeal for your house. Just as Jesus had zeal for your house, oh, Give me a passion for God's glory in the church. I want you to know, precious people, I want you to know that zeal for his house did consume Jesus. It did. Because when he went to the cross, he was eaten up He was consumed. He was the demonstration of God's glory. He was crucified. He was buried in the ground to purchase a holy people for the glory of God's name. Did you know this? Oh man, how gracious Jesus is. Do you know this? Do you know that because Jesus has done this for you, because he was so consumed by the Father's glory that he laid his life down, do you know this? God is not mad at you. God is not mad at you. After everything that you've done, he is not mad at you because he's pleased with his son. He's pleased with Jesus and we are in Christ. For all those who have believed in him, we are in him, hidden in Christ, Colossians says. We're hidden in him. He's not mad with you. Therefore, all the more, let us say, oh Lord, give me a zeal for your house, for your glory, like Jesus had. Set me apart for God. Let love abound in me. Let grace flow from me. Let your zeal, oh God, become my zeal. I want to ask you this morning whether you are caught in the tolerance trap, tempted to relax your beliefs, thinking you can fool God in your lifestyle, I want you to just consider, have you miscalculated the cost of following Jesus, that all Jesus wants from you is everything? It's going to be painful. It's actually going to be painful for some of us, for all of us. Have you minimized the consequences of sin in your own life? And so you're missing the sheer brilliance of grace. Are you still committed to church unity? I've got to tell you, the Lord is really stirring in something in me at the moment. It really is. I can't actually fully explain it, but I, I guess it's connected to this last verse that we keep seeing through every church. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. What is that saying? What is that saying? It's just, it's not just a phrase, a poetic phrase. It's saying, receive the Holy Spirit, not just for conversion, but over and over and over again for a filling. 
just as Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's been stirring in me so far this year. It really has. Because I believe that there might be some of us here who are resistant to feeling the gentle pinch of the Holy Spirit, perhaps resistant to the potential that God has for you if you would let go and give control to the Holy Spirit in your life. You know, Spurgeon said that a person is an awful weapon in the hand of God. A holy person is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Maybe you want status quo. You want things to be nice. You want your church to be easy. You don't, you don't want to make waves. You, you want the prayer meeting to be shallow. You want, you know, not to have to face much. You have no passion, no zeal for the things of God. No expectation maybe that God is going to move, that he can move. Real belief that things could change, that transformation could really come. Do you have an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to you? Receive the Holy Spirit. Are you willing to be filled by the Spirit? I confess that sometimes all I want to do in my role as your pastor is I want to go to the office, I want to do some church stuff, prepare a sermon, but I actually want to close myself off to anything that the Holy Spirit really wants to do in my life. But he's stirring in me. He's asking me to let him have more of me, and it's painful. But if you let him, you'll never be more alive in faith. You'll never be more used, never be more filled up with what God wants to do through you. I don't want to tolerate status quo. I don't want to tolerate compromise. I don't want to tolerate sin. I don't want to tolerate a life that has one foot in one camp and one foot in the church. I want to have a zeal for his house, for his glory. Do you want that in your life? Are you willing to receive what the Spirit wants to do in your life? He who has an ear, let him hear. Take a moment to worship Jesus, to say, Jesus, be the center of my life. That's what we're going to sing in just a moment. But before we get there and just sing the lyrics of that song, Make it true in your heart. Make it true. Jesus, be the center of my life. Let it be your prayer, your worship, your cry. Father, stir up in our hearts, I pray. This openness to give more of ourselves to you, to give you every part, to not hold off any limits. Oh Lord, forgive us so often for having one foot in one camp and one in yours, which just doesn't make sense. And, it's, and it can't stay. So Lord, pray that we would be humble enough in spirit to come before you now, confess our sin. We know as we do, that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Restore hope to hearts today, Lord, I pray. Oh, Lord, take us to those deep places that you might make us soar with you. Pray.